Wow, this is really nice, um, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, I want to make a special thanks to Hafsa, who, who oh. never gave up on trying to get me scheduled for this lecture. <laughs> she first started um, working on this. Uh, my wife had just given birth to our first child. That was uh, about six months ago, like five and a half months ago. And I had no idea how scatterbrained it would make me. Um, and, um, and, and I mean, reporting for radio. <laughs> That's right. It's radio. It's radio. It's the magic radio. It's already a very kind of scatterbrain um, experience. So you have to be a little bit crazy to do it. Um, but um, I, I, first of all, let me ask how many people know what KPCC is or Southern California Public Radio? Who, oh, that is fantastic. Okay. That, that makes me happy. So how many people listen to KPCC? Okay. So how many people knew who I was? <laughs> How many people think I look like my voice? <laughs> um, I, I actually, I wanted to start with, um, I, I'm a really, I was talking to the people uh, that I was waiting with about how much I love working for KPCC and Southern California Public Radio. And what I thought would be nice as a start, before I get into this tale of two stories, is just to do a little mission statement comparison between Southern California Public Radio, KPCC, and the Pacifica Institute. Okay, um, and, and I just wanted to take some notes. So first of all, this is our brand new annual report, which really gives you a lot of information about the ground that the station covered in the last year, where we're looking in the future. It's a very exciting document, and it's hot off the presses. Like I walked in there today, and they said, well, if you're going to do this tonight, we should hand you these. This is brand new. So, um, and I have about 20 of them over there, if, and, they're, and, and they're yours to take. There are a lot of pictures, there are a lot of graphs about the funding of public radio so that you can really see how it breaks down, how much we rely on listeners, not the government, you know, and just the things that we're trying to accomplish at KPCC. But the first page of it is, is always the mission statement, and I, I wanted to read the mission of Southern California Public Radio is to strengthen the civic and cultural bonds that unite Southern California's diverse communities by providing the highest quality news and information through radio and other interactive media. So and then I went on the Pacifica website and I was like, all right, because I was referred here. The way I discovered Pacifica was when there was an earthquake in Turkey. My editor, who's a very academic woman and knows a lot about a lot, said you should try the Pacifica Institute. So it worked. And um, the um, Pacifica Institute, I like to read this, working within and across communities for the creation and extension of positive connections within and between disparate social networks. So I wanted to make that comparison to say that KPCC, Pacifica, we're kind of doing the same thing. We're taking different and sometimes very similar methods uh, we do have events uh, at KPCC in the Crawford Family Forum. Um, we have a website. So we're, we're trying to accomplish a lot of the same goals, connecting people who have bonds, strengthening bonds, uh, fostering diversity, celebrating diversity, but also bringing people together. Um, so I wanted to applaud the Pacific Institute and say, we're with you. Um, um, so. So I'm Brian Watt. You heard a little bit about me. I just I wanted to say that I am. I moved here about 12 years ago, to be an actor, like most people who move here. And um, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. So I'm not a uh, I'm not a West Coast guy. I'm not necessarily a local person. But this is as long as I've lived anywhere in my adult life. Um, and now that my son was born here, then this really is home. Um, and. I did start at Marketplace. I, I got to do some television shows and, you know, and as an actor, but acting was not constant enough and public radio kept beckoning. If you're an actor, you actually have a lot of time on your hands and you have a lot of time to listen to public radio. So the more I listened to public radio in my kitchen while I was waiting for the phone to ring, the more I thought I might be able to do it. So. Um, so I got Marketplace to take a chance on me because I didn't go to school for journalism. I'd never written an article. And um, so it was 
great that they saw in me a creative person who could bring like a new perspective. Um, and they have plenty of people who have esteemed journalism careers, who've worked for big newspapers, and so they can help people like me who are beginners. Um, so I just, I, I wanted to say that. I, I think on the bio that went out to everyone, it was the old bio that says I had my first broadcasting job when I was 11. And I was explaining that I, um, there was a little children's television show in Charlotte, and they needed, they needed a guy who could read and look at the camera. And that was me. And it was, it was really, really fun, but it lasted about three or four years, and then I wanted to be an actor, not a broadcaster. So that was the path I took for a while. So um, KBCC took me in, uh, was it like, well, she said, Tafsa said how long I've been with KBCC. I forget. Um, but they agreed to bring me on. I was a producer at Marketplace, and producers don't normally get to go on the radio, but because I had a pretty well-trained voice, um, I filed stories, and sometimes they would let me host the Marketplace Morning Report, which you hear now. Um, and KPCC said, we need to give opportunities to producers who want to be reporters. So that's how I started. I was essentially an intern, a paid intern at KPCC when I started, a fellow, um, thanks to the Annenberg Foundation. That, you know. And um, hello, come on in. No oh, it's, OK, welcome. Um, so, so why have I called this? This lecture is called The Tale of Two Stories. Um, the nuts and bolts of how public radio reports come together. So I want to play two stories for you all this evening. Um, and and I, one of them is the example of the story that we work on for a really long time. It's four minutes of radio, but it might take four weeks to get done. Not four weeks constant all-nighters, but four weeks to get the idea and to turn that idea into action, <clears throat> to decide, to think about what you want to do and, and then make it happen. So, um, and then, then I'm going to play another story that took four hours. And so that's the dichotomy. That's the, the contrast that I want to show. So, so the first story that, uh, that I'm going to play is the one that's here. <coughs> On, on our website. Um, this was less than a year ago, July 25th of 2011. Um, and what we've done at KPCC is we've tried to expand our staff as we've hired some new reporters and we really have decided to try to organize ourselves in terms of beats. I mean, the journalists would call this beats. The word in today's workplace is vertical. It's instead of the education beat or the entertainment beat, the word that is being used is uh, the education vertical. So, um, so we are going to launch the business and economics vertical at KPCC. And we wanted to come out with a splash. We wanted to make a splash and say, here we are. This is what we're doing. So what we decided, we looked at what was going on in Los Angeles at the time. And we realized that we were on the verge of having another major grocery strike at Ralph's Bonds and Albertsons and that there was the contract had already expired there was a lot of already a lot of picketing a lot of saber rattling so we said you know what let's 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 have a meeting about what kinds of stories we could do that prepare that that create context so that if this strike happens people feel like they're really well informed so we had a long meeting and we brainstormed and we brainstormed about what would be interesting, and we decided to do a five-part series on just the grocery industry, the grocery market, for lack of a better term, in Southern California. So this was the first story, and I think I'd rather just play it. This is something we do in radio rather than try to explain everything. You play it first and see what people understand. So um, I will just say, just because every story does have an intro that the hosts, the hosts back in the studio read, um, I will say that the goal of this story was to focus on the larger alternatives that people in Southern California have to Ralph's, Bonds, and Albertsons, the three grocery chains that were 
um, in danger of having a strike. And that's what this first story was going to be about. So um, I'm going to play this. It's four minutes. Um, and then we'll talk. We'll, we'll deconstruct it. All right? And, and I will, I'm going to play it. Let me just start this. And if you, didn't, you don't get the beginning of this or you feel like you can't hear it, then I, I can start it over. But uh, we tested this out. I think this is going to be okay. So. I get the fix of chocolate. For music teacher Deborah Schrader and her family, the chocolate fix is the chocolate in blocks at Trader Joe's near her home in Rolling Hills. She also likes the selection of nuts and fruit. We grow a lot of our own vegetables, and I do shop at the farmer's market every week, so I don't need a whole lot of fresh things, but Trader Joe's carries the things I need. Schrader discovered that during the grocery store labor dispute eight years ago. She shopped at Ralph's, one of the big three, along with Vons and Albertsons. Each week, she'd march into Ralph's with an envelope full of coupons she'd clipped. But when the labor dispute hit, she didn't want to cross picket lines, so she tried Trader Joe's and got hooked. It's got a great atmosphere. Some of the people who work here are very entertaining. There's a fellow who sings at the place where he passes out samples. I just feel very much like it's a neighborhood place. They just do what they do very well. Robert Hermans directs USC's Food Industry Management Program. He says during the labor dispute, a lot of shoppers looked for a new place to buy groceries. And says Hermans, They discovered Trader Joe's. They discovered Costco. They discovered Standard Brothers, Bristol Files, and other independents. And when the strike concluded, a number of those customers opted not to return, or at least not to return in the same amount of shopping in the, the three traditional supermarkets. Herman says the big three lost a big chunk of the market, and now they're up against national powerhouses Walmart and Target. Both now sell groceries in their stores. About four years ago, British-based Tesco, the world's third biggest grocery seller, jumped into the fierce Southern California market. Tesco's fresh and easy stores are smaller than traditional supermarkets. Their fare targets people who want to eat healthy but are too busy to spend a lot of time shopping and cooking, like Vivian Bowers. Because a lot of it is packaged and ready to go. Either you can put in the microwave or the oven. Um, it's an individual or usually portions for at least two people, so it's perfect for my husband and I. The vegetables are, many of them are pre-washed and ready to go. I think the Southern California consumer is the trendsetter, is the early adopter, is looking for the new thing, the healthier thing, looking for value for sure. Fresh and Easy Chief Tim Mason came to Town Hall Los Angeles to talk about booming Southland shoppers, something he says isn't easy. He says retailers have to study what sells and what doesn't and make the changes that shoppers want. When we change things to be more fresh and easy, to be unique, more unique, to be healthier, to be fresher. They loved it. When we changed things to be more like other supermarkets and took something out that was fresh and easy to do it, they would get very cross with us. Don't do that. We don't need another supermarket. What we love about you is that you're different. Here's something different. Fresh and easy's locations. Company boss Tim Mason says they open stores where other supermarkets aren't. Vivian Bauer shops at the South L.A. location at Central Avenue and Adams Boulevard, next to the dry cleaning business her family has run since the 1960s. I'm going to tell you something. The store that was here before, most of the food was expired. The food was horrible. And so it's a joy. And I see the, the customers that I know are my customers at the cleaners and neighbors in the community that are thrilled. And she said those customers are tough, just like she is. I watch prices. I watch calories, I watch expiration dates, I want the best for my dollar, and I feel like it in here. A lot of shoppers have found stores where they can get the best for their dollar, and they aren't Ralph's, Bonds, or Albertsons. More on that next time. Brian Watt, 89.3, KPCC. Okay, so you get to see just how hard it is to sit in a room with like a whole group of people and listen to four minutes of radio. I mean, to me, it's excruciating. <laughs> and, I, and I do it. <laughs> Did it go by fast? All right, well, good. Well, um, but it, so, um, so let, let me tell you a little bit about that story and why it took so long to do. 
I mean, you, you can hear why it would take so long to do, because it took place in three different places. Um, first place, the Trader Joe's in Palos Verdes, okay? So, does anyone here work for Trader Joe's? Come on now. <laughs> Raise your hand. All right. Um, I'm glad. Uh, the Trader Joe's, uh, so, we're, so we're at this Trader Joe's. We need a shopper who goes to Trader Joe's. We need a shopper who not only goes to Trader Joe's, but who started going to Trader Joe's during the last strike, who discovered Trader Joe's. How are we going to find this person? And we could, like, just wait for people to walk out of every Trader Joe's. Um, but this is something new that KPCC is doing that has really made my job easier. Um, we now have a network called the Public Insight Network, where we ask anybody who is willing to sign up for this network, tell us a little bit about themselves, and we will just send out questions to the network that says, what happened to you during the last grocery strike? How did you live it? Did you change your shopping habits because of the last grocery strike? Um, uh, are you having a problem because the wind blew down trees in your yard? Um, any, anything. You know, we're looking for real people to tell the stories in Southern California, and this network really, really helps us. Uh, and we call it the Public Insight Network, and a really nice woman named Sharon McNary runs the network, and it's, it's absolutely amazing the people that she finds. So Deborah Schrader, the woman in this photo, uh, was found through that network. And so not only was Deborah Schrader willing to talk to us about the network, I mean about her shopping experience, but she was willing to get a little sneaky with me, which I'll explain. This is why I asked if anybody here works for Trader Joe's. <laughs> Retailers don't really like it when you just walk into their store and start recording. They don't really like it, when you, especially if you have a video camera, but that's not what we were talking about here. Um, Generally, the first time you call a retail PR department and ask if you can do something like this, they just say no. Um, even if it's a positive story, which you could argue in this situation is a positive story for Trader Joe's. Um, so that's where the iPhone comes in. Um, and we were talking about this. Um, so Deborah was willing to let me accompany her while she shopped in her Trader Joe's and just record her on my iPhone. And so I was being really close to her. You know how she was talking about that guy who sings in her Trader Joe's? We went up to where he is. He was handing out the samples like they do at Trader And she was kind of trying to engage him and get him to sing, but she didn't want him to know he was being recorded. But he wasn't in the mood to sing that day. We just kept going. So, so the story... The story Starts at Trader Joe's. We're only in there for a couple of minutes. I interviewed her right where you see her here in the parking lot. That's her in the parking lot of the Trader Joe's. That's where the interview took place. That's, that's fine. Um, so it was sneaky. Um, it's not something I do all the time. If I was working on a negative, like, hit, bad piece, I wouldn't do something like that. We just needed a little bit of sound from inside a Trader Joe's. So we thought asking for forgiveness would be better than asking for permission. And actually, I did email them. They just didn't get back to me very quickly. So we just we did this. No one died. Everyone's OK. So, so and Deborah Schrader was just so generous with her time. The cool thing about this network is that pe there are people who listen to KPCC, so they understand what we're trying to do. So I just, I wanted to tell you about this network and how it's really informing our journalism. It's really helping us do what we do at KPCC. And you can join this network. I just want to tell you, we, if you go to kpcc.org, which will come up, scpr.org, slash network, you can sign up if you want to be a part of it. And nothing, we, don't, we don't turn any of the information you give us over to our marketing department. It's all confidential. You don't say anything to us that's going to be published, broadcast, or anything if you don't want it to, you know? Um, you might want to tell us something on background. 
you, don't, you might want to give us a secret tip about something that's going on without anonymously. We appreciate that. So this network is huge. And this was the perfect example of how it worked. So the other thing I want to say about this story, um, and I'll say for the Fresh and Easy, we were in Fresh and Easy for a few moments. Fresh and Easy is a new chain. They, I, I had gone to some events of theirs. So the PR guy, I just said, look, I just need to go in your store, get some sound. He was like, go. Just tell me which store, and I'll make sure they know you're coming. So Fresh and Easy was really cool. Um, so I'm scrolling up this page here just so you can see. So obviously when you insert the internet into radio, you've got a whole other animal. So here you'll have your headline. I've got to take pictures. I didn't get into this business to take pictures. Now I have to be an expert photographer. Um, so the, you can listen to the story here, but you'll notice here, additional audio. So I interviewed, I had a really nice long interview with the CEO of Fresh and Easy. And you'll notice that this story didn't get into the union question. Because Trader Joe's is non-union, uh, Fresh and Easy also non-union, but the union people really want to organize Fresh and Easy. So I said, if I interview him about this and we just set it apart um, so people can listen to it, you know, that way. Because I had done a lot of stories about the unions. We didn't want this story to be all about unions. We wanted this story to be about grocery stores. So, and of course, you have the script of the story. Um, and then you'll notice that social media is kind of going nuts. You've got people tweeting this story, people putting it on Facebook. This is, this is the new frontier. This is the Wild West. This is where a 43-year-old guy like myself is like, ah, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to tweet, I got to take a picture. Um, and so it isn't the radio that I started doing even eight years ago when I started. Um, let me see if there's anything else. So I just wanted to make sure. So this was the first in a five-part series. Um, my new colleague, Shireen Marisol Maraji, who's just a fantastic reporter, very exciting. She's running laps around me sort of on a daily basis. She did the three stories in the middle, and then I came in at the end with sort of a look back at the issues at play in the, in, in the labor dispute. And um, a lot of the themes that we introduced in this story came back during the series. The idea that we, we focused on, uh, hey, how's it going? Come on in. Um, we, we wanted to focus on the alternatives. We wanted to focus on, uh, what else did we want? We, we, we did, she did three wonderful pieces on ethnic supermarkets and how these ethnic supermarkets had gone into neighborhoods that Ralph's, Vons, and Albertsons moved out of a long time ago, and they are making a killing. So that's what her story was about. And we sat in, we probably met for two hours about what you could say about supermarkets. And I mean, when you're talking about food and where people buy it, you could do an entire week of hour-long shows about this topic. So we had to rein ourselves in and get really, really focused. So we're really proud of this five-part series. And um, this is an example of a story that took a while. It, it took. We got lucky because Tim Mason from Fresh and Easy was giving this talk at Town Hall LA. Normally, he's not the kind of guy that wants to show up and just do interviews. You don't just call the CEO of a company. That fell into place. But this, this took a while. And it airs twice. I mean, it's on the website forever. But this is four minutes of radio. But it, it probably took me about four weeks to get done. So that's one story. How are we doing on time? I just want to make sure. Yes, OK. So um, just making sure. So, so I was really happy. And a lot of the stories that I do are like this. Uh, they take a while. Um, but then the magic of radio is that sometimes you're just somewhere, and you, you talk to the right people in the right place at the right time. And the next story that I'm going to play is a perfect example of that. And it's not four minutes long. Um, but um, this is a story about a church in South Los Angeles that decided to display photos of all of the known victims at that time of the Grim Sleeper serial killer. Um, and um, 
I think what I'll do, and so I basically went and I interviewed people who were going to look at these photos. And you, you can kind of see what's going on here in the picture. So what I, I it's going to take me a sec to pull this up, but <clears throat> I'm just going to play the story and then we'll go back and explain it. Right on. Okay, so um, about two and a half minutes. Like I said, we're we're at a we're outside a church in South Los Angeles that just decided we're going to put photos and names of the victims of the Grim Sleeper up, and people can just come and look at them if they want to write. They can. So this is that story. Cars passed, and sometimes the wind blew down the easels bearing the photos but that hardly deterred a steady stream of visitors. Some arrived to honor a victim they knew, others came to honor all the victims. That's what Deborah Jackson did, but then she read one of the names. Oh my God, that was one of my students. Who's that? Princess. 14-year-old Princess Bertha Mew, believed to be the Grim Sleeper's 10th victim, which was found strangled in an Inglewood alley in March of 2002. You didn't even know. I don't think any of us knew. Bethel AME Church framed each photograph in blank card space where Jackson and other visitors could write messages. I could have been the one named Deborah Jackson because her name and mine is the same. But Princess was one of our students. Police say Deborah Jackson was the Grim Sleeper's first victim in 1985. She was 29 years old. Amidst the many wishes to rest in peace written by her photo, someone scribbled, it took a while, but justice will be served. May God have mercy on your soul, Mary. Chris. Chris McNair saw the photos outside the church. The 52-year-old contractor stopped his van to write a message to victim Mary Lowe. We grew up together. Same neighborhood. I mean, you know, everybody in the neighborhood, you, you know different females. The females know the guys. You know, we're all one clique. And uh, she went astray, and she never made it back. And McNair also met the man authorities believe killed Mary Lowe and nine others. Police arrested auto mechanic Lonnie Franklin Jr. last month after investigating for decades. And as soon as I heard 81st off of Western, I immediately called my friend, who's a hairdresser. He said, man, you know Lonnie. Remember we went, I took you over his house to get a part for your car back in like 83 or something like that? Uh, it's too, that's too close. McNair finds it hard to believe Franklin is the Grim Sleeper, but he also says he really doesn't know what to believe. Brian Watt, 89.3 KPCC. A little street corner noise, just to, you know. Um, so, let me tell you that uh, the first thing I want to say about that story <clears throat> is that I almost didn't go. Um, the same day, in the morning, the Salvation Army took uh, a group of kids to Target who were, they were about to return to school and they were going to have a free shopping spree and it's a very inspiring story of like underprivileged kids who live in homeless shelters who get to go and shop in Target and get the clothes they want and I interviewed a great kid that day and, and but my boss, Nick Roman, said, you know, they've got these pictures up at this church in South L.A. Just go and see what it is. You know, if you don't mind, do you think you have time? So I went, and I was probably out there for about an hour, um, during which time I spoke to the, the two people that you hear in that story. Um, and... The, the interesting thing, this is, you know, this, there are a lot, a lot of interesting things going on here. First of all, it's eerie. When you meet someone who knows a victim, but who also interacted with the killer, and is sort of just realizing that as they're talking to you, you know, I wanted that on the radio, you know? And you, you could see it. You could kind of see it in this guy's voice. Now, and he was very forthcoming. 
the, the gentleman that we hear from. He's very, very forthcoming, very ready to speak, very ready to talk through his emotions about this. Um, and that's what I find is interesting about radio is that, and microphones in public places, is in situations like this, people just, sometimes people just need to talk, you know? And they, they say very interesting things, they say very moving things, and they feel better when you've listened to them, when you haven't gone, okay, thanks, I got to go. And um, I could tell that was the case with this gentleman. The interesting thing about the woman that we hear from at the beginning of the story, I just happened to be standing next to her at one of the photos, and my microphone was on when I heard her say, oh my god, this is one of my students. I, I was lucky to catch that. And then I turned to her and obviously I wanted to talk to her, but she didn't, she told me she did not want to talk to me. She said, no, I, I'm sorry, I can't. And I said, okay, you know, but she kept talking and she kept coming back. So it was like she was telling me she didn't really want to talk, but, but every time I tried to kind of take distance, she would bring me a little bit closer and say a little bit more. And um, so it's another, so I just, I kept going. You know, I just kept listening. And it, it, it was one of the more magic moments in radio for me as a reporter. When you, when you, when you discover that you, you can't always be the aggressive, go get them, get in there, get the story, get out. You know, sometimes you just have to let moments breathe. And so, so this woman was, you know, I, I, by the end it was pretty clear. She, she knew I was still recording. She knew she was talking to me. Um, and, and our exchange wasn't very long. It actually wasn't much longer than what you heard in, in the story. Um, but uh, it, 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 that was a day when I learned a lot, um, when I realized that I was a little better at this than I thought. Um, and there are, you know, journalists have different takes on attitudes when they go in to interview people into different settings. And I've never been a super confrontational person. I've never been an aggressive pursuer of um, quotes and try to lock people in and pin them down, um, try to make pe what people are saying fit the idea that I have of a story before I even show up somewhere. I'm much more the person who just shows up somewhere and presses record. And so this, this was a moment when I felt particularly validated. So like I said, I was there for an hour, hour and a half, took a few pictures, um, went back to the studio. And this was just, it was one of those perfect days when, and this is actually a good opportunity for me to show you. I'm, I'm going to have to just hold this screen up, like this computer up, so that you get a sense of what radio looks like now. You know what it sounds like. But I, my laptop didn't mesh with this projector. So I wanted to show you, and I mean, you can even pass this around if you promise not to drop it. But this, <laughs> this is the... Um, audio editing software. Um, so the, um, the grocery story that we were listening to before. Pro Tools? It's uh, Adobe Audition. Okay. Actually, Pro Tools is heavy and hard to use for me, but most people use it. I just find Adobe a lot easier and faster. But it's you know multi-track, and I'm doing all this myself. I don't just write all this up and record it and turn it over to someone else. I've got to make all this sound the way it sounds. But I, if anyone wants to take a look at just what it, what it, how intricate the whole thing is, um, you know, yeah, just I thought it would be an interesting visual so that people understand. I mean, anyone who's in radio school or like broadcasting in a class, they, it's it's you know old hat but you know in some in some settings you are 
there are producers and engineers who will do this for you, but not at KPCC. We're, we're doing this sometimes in the front seats of our cars. So, um, no, and I'm not lying. Um, what exactly is doing that? What do you mean? Uh, no, it, it's okay. Um, but look, I, I guess the, um, I, I wanted you all to see that because by the time I got back to my studio, it was about 4 o'clock. Generally, if you're going to get something on the air that night on KPCC, you need to have a script by 4.30. And I hadn't even started writing. And so, but this was just one of those stories where the people and the characters were so strong, there actually wasn't that much writing to do. You know? It's like, this is a woman who's talking about Deborah Jackson. Uh, this is, and she's talking about one other victim. So let's just figure out which victims these are, spell them out. This man's talking about Mary. Let's figure out who Mary is. Let's talk about her circumstance and let him talk. So I, what I like to say is you got to get out of the way of your audio. So my job in that half hour that I have to, had to write this story, if it was going to get on the air that night, was just to step back, you know, to, to let, let the people in the story talk as much as possible. Um, so... Um, so that's, so that's how long it took me to write the story. And then I had to mix it together, which looks a little bit like what you, you're seeing. And we, and we got it on the air, I think, by like um, 6.20. And, you know, I knew I had something. But because it didn't take very long to do, I didn't think a lot about it. But um, that's actually the story that won best radio news reporting golden microphone from radio television news association um that story it won that um two years ago and that was four hours of my life <laughs> so um so it's you know it's a it's a, sometimes radio is extremely tedious you know the the show Behind the curtains, the behind the scenes, backstage is, is tedious and it's a lot of just fighting with your, your tape and listening and going, oh, we didn't say it perfectly that time. What are we going to do? I can't use this. Like You probably noticed in um, the grocery story that my expert from USC, he sounded terrible. It was terrible audio. He's a big USC guy, but he spends a lot of time in Seattle. So I had to call him in Seattle and record an over-the-phone interview. He had a terrible phone wherever he was in Seattle. And I just sat there and I fought with that sound for hours trying just, and I, at, at some point I just said, we need this guy, so he's gonna have to be in here. He doesn't sound great, but we need this guy. So there's a, there are days when it's super tedious, and then there are days like, like this one when it's magic and it serves a purpose. And, you know, we're, we're at the end here so of, of my talk, so I, I'll just go back to the mission statement, you know, which really is strengthening the cultural and civic bonds of Southern California's diverse communities. And I feel like both of those stories on very different planes did that. We had a woman in Palos Verdes, Trader Joe's, in the same story with a woman who's run a dry cleaners in South Los Angeles, and they both go grocery shopping. You know, they're in the same region, but they're worlds apart. And then, then we had a bunch of people who, I mean, the Grim Sleeper thing is kind of, it's an abstract notion for a lot of us, for those of us who don't live in South Los Angeles. But these people live where these victims lived, knew them, and may have bought an auto park from the guy who killed them all. So that's what we try to do at KPCC. And um, that's a tale of two stories, <laughs> how, that's how radio reports come together. And so that's, that's, that's my offering this evening. Um, and yeah, please, please ask questions. I'm better at answering questions than I am at making presentations. But yeah, first. 
I do have a question. When you um, came across that twist where the gentleman knew the auto mechanic who was the serial killer, I mean, none of us ever think we're going to know a serial killer, but when you think about it, right. serial killers know a lot of people. <laughs> when you came across that twist, Man. did you want to make the story longer or expand and go in that direction, or are you already locked into a certain amount of time? And Because I wanted to hear more about that. Well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, this man knew him only because he had gone that one afternoon to get, um, you know, because this guy ran a chop shop in his back garage. I mean, he was just one of those guys that would break apart old cars and sell parts. And the, the killer, the, the alleged killer. And um, uh, so this man didn't know him but had encountered it. Um, and, and as I said at the end of the story, I, you know, he, this guy was still in disbelief that this man was the killer. And the truth of the matter is, in, in, in situations like this one, people just don't, they don't have time to, to do long interviews. You can't interview, I didn't get to interview that man for 20 minutes. He was a contractor on his lunch break. He just pulled his truck over. And while he was glad to talk to me, he didn't have all day. You know? So it was, I, I would have, uh, you know, you asked that question. The, the, the woman, the teacher in the school, I would have liked to have known more. Which school? Um, you, know, you, you know, go back and try to do a background check and see if this particular victim actually went to this elementary school. You know, the kinds of things that the guys who broke the City of Bell scandal story had to do to really, to really put something like that on the air. But this was, this was one of those immediate like things that happened that day, and if you wait too long, you know, it's just not. And you know, another thing is, if, if that interview was longer, I think our show Off Ramp, you know, John Raby does a show called Off Ramp on weekends, he probably took the longer interview and kind of let it breathe a little bit. Um, I, I did. I covered a funeral um, of a uh, just one of those high school football players who everyone loved, and for whatever reason, he was having dinner with his girlfriend in a restaurant, and someone just walked up and blew his head off. And I, I had to go down and do a, a piece on the funeral, and it it's a funeral. I mean, you can't if a funeral is on a Friday, you can't run the story on Monday. You have to have that story like up that day. Um, and that was a really interesting situation. I, that story I thought about playing, but you know, I, I wanted to keep it short. But um, that was a four-minute story that I had an afternoon to get done. And at some point in an event like a funeral, you look up and go, I have to leave or this story won't get on the air. I can't stay to the end of this funeral. I'm going to have to get out of here if this story, if I'm going to do justice to these people. So I kept going, okay, I gotta go. But like Stevie Wonder showed up at that funeral out of nowhere. He uninvited and he sang. Wow. And if I had left, he wouldn't have been in my store. <laughs> so um and and he sang beautifully. You know, he sang the Lord's Prayer and it was like heartbreaking, you know. So I, I don't know that that answer that was kind of a rambling answer, but um but but yeah, I mean radio is contained. I mean, it's, um, you know, unless you've got like one of those This American Life pieces, which is a lot more thought to it than, than you probably realize. Um, I mean, that's the thing about radio, is that you, you, you always have to take something out. You can't tell um, someone's entire story. Listen, listen now, actually, I've got a really big story. It's either going to air tomorrow or it's going to air Monday, hopefully sometime next week, on on a warehouse in um, Irwindale uh, that sells um, paintball guns, like airsoft guns. Um, and, they've, and they've hired a veteran of the Iraq War, a guy who served two tours of Iraq. He's like an ammunition and like arms expert. That guy's story is extremely interesting. But the story was about the warehouse and all the people who've been able to get work at the warehouse in the last three years. It, it couldn't be just about him. 
So hopefully off ramp will take that sound and do his story. So, so you had a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Does your acting background help you? In oh what you yeah. Do? <laughs> yeah. If so, how? Well, first of all, it. Um, I mean, at the very beginning, it. You know, I, I did a lot of. Um, you learn how to project. Uh, your voice becomes very well trained as an actor. You do a lot of vocal exercises. You learn how to make your voice sound a certain way. You learn how to drum up certain moods in your voice without laying it on too thick. So that's from a vocal place. I mean, you, you heard, I would say, two different tones from me in these two stories, right? Two, two very different ways of talking in these two stories for people who got to hear both. And, um, you know, yes. Um, the other, there are a couple other places where it helps. I, as I was saying, I, I didn't go to school for journalism. I didn't go to journalism school, never took a journalism class, never wrote an article for the school newspaper. Um... I just, I had a dad who insisted that I'd be a good writer. My father is a lawyer and also a very good writer, and he's just one of those guys who just, it was very important to him that I know how to write. Just be a good writer, whether you're writing a newspaper article, a menu, <laughs> an essay for school, write well. So I had that in my favor, but what I also feel like acting has done for me is it's made me a good storyteller. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's there's journalism and then there's storytelling. You know, you know, journalism is a lot of facts and obviously those are important. But uh, creating images, mm -hmm. you know, like this woman who go who used to go to Ralph's every day with her envelope full of coupons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that's a very familiar image, I think, to a lot of people who grocery shop or who grocery shop at Rouse. Um, that's theatrical. So, yes. Um, and then sometimes you, I, I feel like because of my acting ability, um, I am a reporter that KPCC likes to have live on the scene. Because what I can do is, if I'm live on the scene of a wildfire, I can kind of capture the mood of what it's like out there. If I'm, if I'm live on the scene at a picket line of a strike that just started, which was kind of the story of my first year at KPCC, because when the Writers Guild went on strike, I was the guy who covered that. And I, and I just walked the picket lines and interviewed people every day. And so I'm able to, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't call it an affectation. I actually kind of get swept up in moments <laughs> and it's, it's just what I'm inspired to do. So people, people like to, they like to have someone who's not going to sound boring and who's going to be able to capture the, the drama or just, just whatever, whatever's in the air at, at a given um, event. Um, and then sometimes you go somewhere and you need to say, you need to talk for about a minute and you don't know everything, but you think of three things that you do know and you sound extremely. <laughs> <laughs> because you only have a minute. I mean, you don't have time to tell them everything. You just tell them what you know. Next time I'll tell you more when I know more. But if you sound really good, authoritarian, Authoritarian, authoritative, you know, trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs>